Vale of Arran is a long, wide, fertile valley entirely ringed by the great grey-green peak of the mighty Mountains of the Moon. It is widely known to be as rich as it is beautiful. Perhaps that was why the first Andal invaders chose to land there when they crossed the narrow sea beneath the banners of their gods, driving out the first men, burning their weirwoods as they went. The proof of that claim lies in the stones carved all about the fingers, which bear images of the sword, stars and axes of the Andals. The sacred book of the faith, the Seven Pointed Star, speaks of a golden land amidst towering mountains that matches the description of the Vale. When Hugo of the Hill received his vision of the bounty that would one day belong to the Andals, some argued that it was the Vale he saw. Isolated from the rest of Westeros by its towering mountains in its western reaches, the Vale provides the perfect ground for the Andals to carve out their first kingdoms in this new land. The first men who were there before the Andals fought these seaborne conquerors stubbornly, but the Vale was thinly populated in those days, and to some extent still is today. The first men soon found themselves outnumbered in every battle, and the tide was slowly beginning to turn to that of the invaders. No sooner was one long ship set aflame or driven back to the sea, ten more rose from the dawn on the horizon. Nor could the first men match the zeal of the invaders. Their bronze axes and armour of bronze scales proved less than equal to the steel swords and iron ringmail of the Andals. The Andals outmatched the first men in every conceivable way. Moreover, the Vale and its surrounding peaks were divided into a score of petty kingdom when the first Andals began wading ashore, with the seven-pointed star painted on their chests. Driven by ancient enmities, the kings of the first men did not unite against the invaders when they first appeared, but rather made pacts and alliances with them, seeking to use the newcomers in their wars against one another. A familiar folly that was able to be repeated time and time again as the Andals spread out across Westeros. Dwayne Shell and John Brightstone, both of whom claimed the title King of the Fingers, went so far as to pay Andal warlords to cross the sea, each thinking they could use their sword against the other. Instead, the warlords turned on their hosts. Within a year, Brightstone had been taken, tortured and beheaded, and Shell roasted alive inside his wooden longhaul. An Andal knight named Corwin Corbray took the daughter of the former for his bride and the wife of the latter for his bedwarmer, and claimed the fingers for his own. Though Corbray, unlike many of his fellows, never named himself king, preferring the more modest style of Lord of the Five Fingers. Further south, the wealthy harbour of Goldtown on the Bay of Crabs was ruled by Osgood Shet, third of his name, a grizzled old warrior who claimed the ancient glorious title King of the True Men, a star that supposedly went back tens of thousands of years to the Dawn Age. Though Goldtown itself was seemingly secure behind its thick stone walls, King Osgood and his forebearers had long been waging an intermittent war against the bronze kings of Runestone, a more powerful neighbour, house as old and storied as their own. Yorick Royce, sixth of that name, had claimed the runic crown when his father died in battle three years prior, and had proven to be the most redoubtable foe, defeating Shets in several battles and driving them back inside their town walls. Unwisely, King Osgood turned to the Andals for help in recovering his lost land. Thinking to avoid a similar fate to that of Shell and Brightstone, he sought to bind his allies to him with blood in place of gold and gave his daughter in marriage to an Andal knight, Gerald Grafton, took Sir Grafton's eldest daughter for his own bride and married a younger daughter to his son and heir. All the marriages were performed by septons according to the rites of the seven from across the narrow sea. Shet even went as far to convert to the faith himself, swearing to build a great sept in Goldtown should the seven grant him victory. Then he sallied forth with his Andal allies to meet the bronze king. King Osgood won his victory, but he himself did not survive the battle, and afterwards it was whispered among the Goldtowners and other first men that it was Sir Gerald himself who struck him down. Upon his return to the town, the Andal warlord claimed his father in law's crown, dispossessing the younger Shet and confiding him to a bedchamber until such time as he had gotten Sir Gerald's daughter with child. When Goldtown rose up against him, Gerald put down the protest brutally and soon the gutters of the town ran red with blood of the first men, women and children as well. The dead were thrown into the bay to feed the cramps. In the years that followed, the rule of House Grafton remained uncontested, for Sir Gerald proved a sage and clever ruler, and the town prospered greatly under him and his successors, growing to be the first and only city in the Vale. Not all the lords and kings of the first men were so foolish as to invite their conquerors into their halls and homes. Many chose to fight instead, Chief amongst them was the aforementioned Bronze King, Yorick VI of Runestone, who led House Royce to several notable victories over the Andals, at one point smashing seven longships that dared to land upon the shores 
and decorating the walls of runestone with the heads of the captains and crews. His heirs carried on the fight after him, for the wars between the First Men and the Andals lasted for generations. The last of the Bronze Kings was Yorick's grandson, Robar II, who inherited runestone from his father less than a fortnight before his 16th birthday, yet proved to be a warrior of such ferocity and cunning and charm that he almost succeeded in stemming the Andal tide for good. By this time, the Andals controlled three quarters of the Vale and had begun to fight amongst themselves, as had the First Men before them. Robar Rice saw an opportunity in their disunity. Across the Vale, a handful of First Men still held out against the Andals, the Red Forts of Red Forts, the Hunters Longbow Hall, the Belmores of Strong Song, and the Cold Waters of Coldwater to Burn, chief amongst them. One by one, Robar made alliances with each of them, and many smaller clans and houses besides, bringing them to his courts with marriages, grants of land, gold, and, in one celebrated case, outshooting the Lord Hunter in an archery contest, though legends claim that King Robar cheated. So honeyed was his tongue that he even won the allegiance of Ulcera Upcliff, a reputed sorceress who called herself Bride of the Merlin King. Many of those lords who gathered beneath his banner had been petty kings, but now they set aside their crowns, bending the knee before Robar Royce and proclaiming him the High King of the Vale, the Fingers and the Mountains of the Moon. The King of the Fingers was the first to fall. Legend tells us that Robar Royce slew Carl Corbray himself after striking Corbray's famous blade Lady Fallen from his hand. Goldtown was retaken by the storm when Robar sent his own sister inside the walls to persuade the Shets to rise against the Graftons and open the city gates. The Hammer of the Hills, the Andal King who held the eastern end of the Vale, was next to face the resurgent First Men and fell before King Robar's host beneath the walls of Iron Oak. For one brief shining moment, it appeared as if the first men might yet retake the lands under the leadership of this brave young king, but it was not to be. Robar had won his last victory, for the remaining Andal lords and their petty kings had finally come to realise their peril, and now it was the Andals who put aside their differences to make a common cause and unite beneath the banner of the single warlord, the Falcon Knight, Sir Artis Aram.